Well, hey, everybody, Mike Griffith here, and welcome to tonight's On the Beat. Very pleased to be joined by Paul Feinbaum, uh, SEC analyst, uh, SEC network host. Paul, with quite a background, uh, we all know he went to the University of Tennessee and worked at the Daily Beacon. Did not know he got in some trouble for uh, writing obituary for the basketball team and thus banned from a trip. I like that story, Paul. Also, Birmingham Post Herald columnist, Mobile Register syndicated. I could go on. Uh, Paul Feinbaum launched his own network on radio, 1993, the Paul Feinbaum Show. I remember hearing it as I drove back and forth to Alabama and Auburn every week on the radio. So years and years, Paul has stoked the SEC passion. I contend, Paul, that you were the SEC network before the SEC network <laughs> even came in existence in 2014. Any thoughts, ideas, regrets, things you do over in this illustrious career you've had? Yeah, I think I would have been a corporate lawyer. Um, no, all kidding, all, all kidding aside, uh, I, I have no regrets. I mean, it's been a, I when you start out as a sports writer and you, you, you deal with everything that, that sports writers have dealt with uh, over the last 35 years and uh, wondering if, if they'll have a job the next week, it, it really toughened me up and I uh, morphed into radio, which then led to here I was the first person hired by the SEC network. And I never dreamed uh, when I got the job a year and a half before the network launched that it would end up, you know, being what it turned out to be. But uh, no, I've had, I mean, I, everyone has regrets about minor things, but uh, I think I'd roll the dice and do it all over again, Mike. Well, you've brought sports journalism a long way, Paul. You've helped uh, the evolution of sports journalism and you've certainly helped carry the interest in the Southeastern conference. And now we find ourselves at a crossroads of sorts, and you've been challenged this offseason to maintain the sports interest and keep the audience engaged, even as we don't have sports. Can you put that into perspective for me? Yeah, and uh, you and I have had a lot of private conversations during these last three months about what I'm about to say. I, 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 none of us have ever been through anything like it. Um, you know, the first couple of days of of COVID-19 were, were gloomy and depressing and none of us really knew what would happen. It was almost like a, a nuclear holocaust. You were afraid to look outside. And finally, we worked our way through it. Um, the, the show that, that I do every afternoon changed a lot. We, we, we went from talking about the NCAA basketball tournament to talking about spring football to would we have football? And then in late May, uh, it seemed like that had been answered. I remember that uh, Friday leading into Memorial Day weekend, we had Greg Sankey on and other people, and it was like celebration, like last day of school. We're, we're you know, we're, we'll see you in September. Uh, and then in the last couple of days, uh, it's come undone a little bit. And, and in the midst of all that, for, uh, for the last four weeks, Mike, we've had we, we've had another uh, epic conversation that I never thought uh, we would have to this degree, and that's the in the aftermath of uh, what happened, uh, the tragedy with George Floyd, and it, it has. Uh, for a quiet time of the year, uh, I, I don't ever remember uh, dealing with more stress, you know, just from a day to day, not so much myself, but just listening to the audience stress out over so many uh, critically important issues. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. You think about COVID-19 and certainly the, the racial awareness and sensitivity that's that's been rightfully raised, how coaches and programs have responded to that, Paul. And you know, we haven't even gotten into the name, image, likeness and how that's going to change the game or the one-year transfer rule. I, I truly feel like sports is, is going through some sort of a, a revolution of sorts. But let me ask you, dialing it back to COVID-19, and, and people ask this question, um, you know, we taped the show earlier today, and it's a moving target, but, but where are we now? I know you had some comments last Friday. Uh, I've taken a little bit different tack that, you know, these players are going to say, hey, we want to play. We've got some earnings on the line. Um, how do you balance all that? And, and where do you think we're at right now? If I were going to ask you to ballpark what the opening game would look like and what the season might look like. Yeah, I think right now it's impossible. And uh, I don't mean to sound like the administrators, uh, but it's probably never been more difficult to predict. If you had asked me two weeks ago, I would have baldly or boldly, <laughs> I'm bald, uh, predicted <laughs> um, that we would have uh, college football in late August, early September. Uh, today looks bad but but you can't you can't measure this minute to minute uh, I know we do uh, I get asked about it every morning and every afternoon and you know do will we have college football and yes no maybe hopefully who knows uh, it's always it's, it's always a different answer um, I think the next couple of weeks will start to uh, evolve you know can can the coaches can the athletic directors uh, can the trainers get everything under control 
so that, and, and most important, I believe, can presidents feel comfortable bringing uh, students back? If they can, if this calms down, I think we'll, we'll be okay. It will be a, nobody ever uh, thought this would be a normal season. Uh, I won't waste your time on the abnormality of, uh, of, of 2020. Um, I think the most important thing is to get to the season right now. And, you know, I, I don't really have a good answer. Um, uh, I mean, it's, it's been a negative weekend. Uh, everything that could go wrong seemingly has gone wrong, Mike. You know, there's no question about it, Paul. And there has been some talks about an abbreviated season. And, you know, maybe if some of these Power Five or Autonomy Five, as Greg Sankey likes to say, some of these teams were to drop some of the, you know, the buy games and play conference games only. Paul, would you be in favor – of an expanded playoff? Could it be time to maybe turn that page now? And what would your thoughts be about how things might look? Would you go to eight? Would you go to 16? What's reasonable? Yeah, I think if, if we have less than the normal season, you have to go to an expanded playoff. It's just not going to work otherwise. And I asked uh, Bill Hancock that question a few weeks ago, and he looked at me like I was from another planet. Uh, you know, he gave me the usual BS about we're still going to do the same thing or, you know, not, just baffling conversation. But, but they would have to. And, and I, I mean, I, I think as you hear commissioners and, and ADs talk, I mean, they meet every day. They talk about every possibility. I would bet they have a contingency plan that would blow, your, blow you away. I haven't seen it. I really haven't heard the details of it. But that, that is so far down the, 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 the list of layers that they are, I think they're dealing with right now. Uh, I think right now they're, 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 not, they're, they're dealing with the present. How do they contain what's happening I think they're all holding their breath and praying that we don't have a, a cataclysmic situation. And we both agree. Uh, mo the majority, if not almost all of the young people getting sick are, are, going, are going to be okay. They may be affected for a few weeks, uh, but it is uh, middle to late June. Uh, you, you just, you have to wonder though, does it, does it transmit to old, older coaches? I mean, we got some, we got some geezers in this league, Mike. I'm not going to call any names like Nick Saban. <laughs> Well, Nick Saban, and then, of course, over in North Carolina, Mac Brown, about the same age. And I've had the same questions. I mean, you know, when is it enough enough financially for these coaches in terms of the risks that they would have to take? And, and now even the inconveniences and challenges of the travel. We're talking to ESPN analyst and SEC Network host Paul Feinbaum. I want to dial things down a little bit to Georgia football and just throw some questions at you, get some instant reaction. Who is Georgia football's biggest rival, Paul? Tell me why. Um, I think it's Florida. Uh, I mean, I, I almost answered Alabama, <laughs> but because in some ways there, there's that battle, but that there's the invisible conversation among fans. But to me, uh, even though I think it may be bigger on the other side, in fact, I know it's bigger on the other side, uh, Georgia, Georgia still has to deal with, with Florida every year. There's no escaping Florida. Uh, there was a time when Tennessee was a little bit more important. Uh, Auburn is a, is a unique uh, rival, but it's not a live or die rival. You can you can get to Atlanta without Auburn. You can't. You, you really can't get there without Florida. Yeah, I would totally agree with you. And you know, you look at you know South Carolina tries to make a case that Georgia is their SEC rival. I guess they they proved it last year. They were the first non ranked team to be the top five Georgia team in Sanford Stadium in history. So what's the value of the Georgia Tech team? I always find it curious. We're all stirred up and in a buzz about Alabama and Auburn and, and, and the stature that takes. And then, and then Georgia's playing Georgia Tech. What, what do you think the value of that Georgia-Georgia Tech rivalry is? Uh, from my standpoint, very little. And, and I say that as someone who, who grew up in that rivalry. Uh, I mean, I'm, I've been around long enough to remember when Georgia Tech mattered. Uh, they really don't anymore. Uh, and yeah, I, I mean, that game, I, I know it's tricky because it's obviously, a, it's, it comes at a weird time uh, in the schedule, but that's not a game that, you know, I, I spent a lot of my Saturdays, Saturdays, as you know, Mike, uh, going through airports, getting places. And, you know, when I go through the crown room in Atlanta or someplace, and I mean, I'm not saying, oh man, Georgia, Georgia Tech game's on. I mean, that's not a game that's, even in, even in Atlanta, it's not going to draw many uh, people to, uh, to watch it. And yet, and still, it played a role in Georgia's season as George Pickens yeah. was thrown out and suspended for the first half and their star yeah. running back was injured. So it, it does play a role, even though I would agree with you, it doesn't seem to carry a whole lot of national interest or even regional interest for that standpoint. You know, I really appreciated having Paul Feinbaum joining us today on the Ingles on the Beat show. Look forward to hear more from Paul later. B before we move on and discuss those takes from Paul, Let's take a moment to recognize the folks at Ingalls that are helping us get through this difficult time 
in our country's history. It's in our hearts to feel for you. There's been ups and downs, turnarounds, there's good days and some bad. But we stand together for worse and for better. We'll always have your back. You talk about rivalries, and the better the team that you are, the more rivals you have. And obviously, Paul identified Florida as Georgia's main rival, even though he said it was a bigger rivalry for Florida than it is for Georgia. And my, how things have changed the last few years. Because before, I think Florida would have told you that, that Florida State was the rival back in the day, or even Tennessee. But now it's Georgia that Florida's you know, completely obsessed about. And I thought that was an interesting take from Paul also when he said that he almost said Alabama, because I kind of, I kind of feel that, you know, when I talk with Georgia players and I think about the season and the imagery of what Georgia has to do to get to where the Bulldogs want to be. And it's to beat Alabama. You know, I had that story on the dog nation page earlier today with Richard LeCount talking about winning a national championship. And the image I chose was, was Richard LeCount putting a goal line hit on an Alabama back, and you, you don't really think of Richard LeCount as a big hitter, but against Alabama, he sure was. And Alabama seems to be that they have been that roadblock, whether it was the 2017 National Championship game or was it the 2018 SEC Championship game. It was Alabama that stood in the way of George getting that elusive National Championship, first one they've had since 1980. So I kind of felt where Paul was going with the Alabama maybe being Georgia's rival now, especially the way Alabama fans talk about Georgia and Kirby Smart and the way the Georgia fans talk about Alabama. It's almost as if, you know, Florida is in the rearview mirror, almost, you know, the Gators are roadkill, if you will, a program that Georgia's clearly passed by, both on the recruiting trail and on the football field. So interesting how those rivalries evolve or – as Paul noted, devolve. And, and I've said this for a long time. This Georgia Tech game, uh, at one point I'm sure it meant a lot. But now it, it's almost a booby prize of rivalry games the, the last week of the season. Not for Georgia fans, and not for Georgia, but just outside interest. It just doesn't hold much interest outside the state. And Paul said not even in Atlanta, uh, frankly. And obviously Atlanta, you know, there's a lot of different fan bases in there. But, but to the point you, you, you wonder – Playing Georgia Tech, last game of the season, you're playing a team in Georgia Tech that has blood in their eyes. You're playing a program that's entire season can be made with an upset over Georgia, a program that's tired of living in the shadow, a little brother program that has something to prove. And if you're Georgia, you're looking forward to the SEC championship game. And how hard must it be to get yourself motivated for Georgia Tech when you know there's a really big game the next week. Uh, to me, I'm just not sure about Georgia, Georgia Tech the last week of the season. I almost wonder, because I've had the conversation with Greg McGarrity before, and, and his point is, well, you got to play somebody. And, and I get that. But I think this is where I might pick up the phone and call Will Muschamp, while he still has a job in South Carolina. And say, hey, Will, how about you talk to Ray, uh, your AD, about moving South Carolina Clemson to the start of the year? Because that doesn't look like it's working out too well for you there. Let South Carolina be the last game of the season. Not Georgia Tech. Let it be an SEC East game that has a chance to mean something and, and be a good football game. Rather than Georgia Tech, I just feel like the Georgia Tech game has devolved into I don't know. It just, I, I don't want to use the word cheap shots, but, you know, the whole situation with George Pickens really soured me, you know, and, and, you know, George should know better. He's a freshman, but because he got into that altercation in the third quarter, he gets suspended for the first half of the SEC title game. You know, DeAndre Swift, I, I know he got injured in the second half is when he left the game, but I think he was actually injured in the first half. There was a play 
where this Georgia Tech guy came up like he was shot out of a cannon. And I think the Georgia Tech guy stumbled off the field too. But the hit was so loud, and I just said, man, I, that, that looked like that really hurt. That looked bad. And, and Swift didn't show any emotion or anything at the time. Running backs typically don't. Even when they're hurt, they do their best to hide it. But I just feel like that's a dangerous game. I, I don't, you know, just an idea. You know, South Carolina is sort of a, you know, sort of a big game. But I, I think I'd rather see Georgia play South Carolina annually in, in a border state game, I, in the, you know, rather than, than Georgia Tech, which is, you know, playing for their lives, playing for everything, uh, all the marbles in the Georgia Tech world. And, you know, it just to me, play that at the beginning of the season. Play it at the beginning of the season. Um, to me, you play at a conference game in the end. You know, we, we see that, with, like I said, with Alabama, Auburn, Tennessee plays Vanderbilt. There's other games like that. Uh, that's my take on it. And, you know, it's interesting, and I know times have changed, and there's certainly been times in history, you know, where Georgia, Georgia Tech really kind of, you know, it, it's just not there anymore. And to me, it's kind of a, a, a no-win deal because if it does turn into a great rivalry again, that means Georgia Tech's going to be good enough to recruit against you and take some of the players from the state. But as it stands, with it not being a good game, not only is there not a lot of television interest, but more importantly, you know, the, the best recruits in the country, they don't, they're not going to be there. They're going to be at Alabama, Auburn, uh, you know, or, or at Florida, Florida State. They're, they're, or, you know, or, heck, South Carolina, Clemson's a more attractive game, frankly. So, you know, you got to think about all those different things. And, I, I, you know, at the risk of, you know, I know there's traditionalists out there, you know, but sometimes, you know, traditions change. You know, teams outgrow them. And to me, where Georgia at right now, as a championship program, I feel like Georgia has outgrown this Georgia Tech rivalry being the last game of the year. And, and that's just my take on it. I'm, I'm with Paul, though. Florida is, is probably still a big rivalry. It'll be interesting to see how the Tennessee rivalry changes now that it's been moved back to November. You know, this year, remember, that's going to be the same weekend. A weekend like no other, uh, you'll have the Masters going on in Augusta, and then you'll have Georgia playing host to Tennessee. It has to be that night. You know, we already looked ahead to the schedule. Uh, I would bet right now that College Game Day will be at Augusta National that day. It's just such a rare, unique opportunity that I think we're going to see the game day set in front of a – we'll see if they let them in the club. They might have to set up out in front all the tradition and rules there. Uh, but I think you're going to see college game day uh, at Augusta National this year. I really do. I think, and then maybe, who knows, maybe Kirby, you know, Kirby loves his golf. Uh, he might get in the Kirby copter and uh, he might fly over there for the morning show to do a segment with uh, David Pollock and Kirk Street. But I just feel like that's going to, it's going to be a night game. We already looked at the schedule and I think Augusta National is going to roll right into that Tennessee Georgia game. And I bet that will be a 7:30 kickoff. Nobody's announced anything. But if you look at the television schedule that day, I think that sets up to be the night game um, as I look across the rest of the league. So, you know, Tennessee, Georgia rivalry, yeah. Um, you know, Auburn, Georgia, yeah. And, you know, that's it's kind of been, you know, the home team of late, uh, sort of, I suppose. I mean, Georgia won their last year, but the, the trip before, obviously, Auburn had derailed an undefeated Georgia season. That's still a rivalry. But, but to me, you know, Georgia, Florida, uh, I, I'm, I'm a – I'm in the mindset like Paul. I almost want to say Georgia, Alabama. I feel that like these teams are going to meet, I think, twice this season, frankly, September 19th in Tuscaloosa and probably again in the SEC title game. Uh, you know, and, and South Carolina sort of claims Georgia is their league rival, but you know, we know Clemson's their big rival. Uh, but, but Georgia Tech, to me, I just, I don't know. That, that, I guess those are my thoughts, and, uh, and I'll leave you with that. It, it's been a fun show. It's always great. Uh, to have Paul Feinbaum join us. I, I like doing his show on the SEC Network. Uh, I was waiting for the right time to bring him on our show. You heard Paul's thoughts on the college football season, what we could be looking at. And obviously, it, you know, that's a very fluid situation and, you know, very important that we do take that into consideration because it does change from week to week to week. But, but this is how things stand right now. Uh, I'm Mike Griffith. I want to thank you again for joining us on our Ingles on the Beat segment. You're going to want to check the story out tomorrow on the dognation.com page. Obviously, Brandon Adams, Dog Nation Daily. He'll be back here on this channel at 10 a.m. And then tomorrow night, it's Connor Riley with Connor in coverage. Jeff Centel on Wednesday night's recruiting show 
before the hedges. Everybody have a safe and wonderful week.